everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to go over hypokalemia. In this video I want to simplify hypokalemia for you. I want to show you what you need to concentrate on for lecture exams, for the NCLEX, give you some tips and tricks on how to remember the causes and the signs and symptoms. So this will be a good refresher to prepare you for your exam. And the great thing about it is that after this video I highly encourage you to go to my website registernursern.com and take the free quiz that goes over hypo and hyperkalemia. It'll test your knowledge on the two and help you make sure you know the difference. And you can access that link in the description below or a card should be popping up that you can click to take that. Okay, let's talk about hypokalemia. Anytime I have a big word like this, I like to take it apart. So I like to take each phrase and dissect what it is because you have a lot of these. You have a lot of hyponatremias, hypernatremias. You want to make sure you know which electrolyte electrolyte you're dealing with. So the first one is hypo. What does hypo mean? It means low. Cal, K-A-L, is the root word for potassium, so we know that we're dealing with low potassium. And emia means blood. So we have low potassium in our blood. So what does that mean? Okay, a normal potassium level is 3.5 to 5.1, and this depends on the lab, but generally this is the range. Some say 5.2, 3.4, but that's what I go with. And anything less than 2.5 or less is dangerous. You need some major intervention, and we'll talk about all those interventions here in a second. Okay, so first let's look at it on a, at a cellular level so you'll understand what's going on. Okay, here is a cell, and when you have your cell, you have all your little organelles and everything, and that's what's in the middle of this. And you have your intracellular part of your cell, which is the inside of the cell, and then you have your extracellular, which is the outside of the cell. Now, potassium loves to live inside the cell compared to the extracellular area. There's less potassium in your extracellular fluid compared to your intra intracellular. So whenever a blood test is ordered for a patient, because a lot of times in the hospital you're going to draw um, electrolytes on a patient or maybe just specifically a potassium level, the blood test is just looking at the potassium in the blood, in the extracellular part. It's not looking in the intracellular. So it's just looking on the ex extracellular. So what's happened in hypokalemia is that there is hardly any potassium left in the blood. It's all probably shift, shifted into the intracellular. So whenever that happens, you get some issues. Now remember, potassium is responsible for nerve impulse connection and muscle contraction. And if you don't have a lot of potassium in your blood for your cells to use, you start getting problems with your GI system, your heart, and everything doesn't want to work appropriately. And we're gonna go over that here in a second, but understanding that will help you understand why you're getting these signs and symptoms whenever you have low potassium in the blood. Okay, what causes this to happen? I wanted to use this mnemonic to help you remember. Now remember, there's low potassium in your blood and your body, remember this phrase, your body is trying to ditch potassium. The key word you wanna get is ditch. So I have taken ditch and I have highlighted it with what you need to remember that causes it. So for D, drugs. Drugs cause low potassium. Anytime you are having diarrhea, you're losing lots of potassium. So laxatives, because la overuse of laxatives causes low potassium because you lose it in the stool. Diuretics like Lasix, it um, wastes potassium. So the patient's urinating a lot and they're losing a lot of potassium. And corticosteroids also cause it as well. I, inadequate intake of potassium, this could be caused by a lot of reasons. They're MPO, they've been MPO for a long time, so they're not taking in potassium. They're, um, they have anorexia, or maybe they're just really sick and nauseous and not able to eat anything, so their potassium level goes down. Okay, T, T is for too much water intake. Whenever you consume too much water with water intoxication, I maybe gave the patient way too much fluids, you can um, dilute the potassium in the blood. 
C for Cushing syndrome. This is where you have too much secretion of aldosterone, which throws off your potassium level. And then H for heavy fluid loss. Now remember, like I said with the laxative use or diuretics, whenever you're losing lots of fluids either through NG suction, remember that? That is a lot of things that your professors like to hit on on exams. They'll say a patient's hooked up to NG tube suction. What do you need to look out for? You need to watch the potassium level because GI secretions are really rich in potassium. A lot of physicians may um, ha have them ordered H2 blockers so that you don't lose that as much. Vomiting, they lose it in their vomit. Diarrhea, any wound drainage, say you got a wound back going or something like that and it's just taking a lot of that fluid out that has the potassium in it and sweating. So anytime you're losing lots of fluids, you're at risk for potassium. Now some other causes for low potassium, you can have where that potassium has moved from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular um, cell, and this is through whenever they're having alkalosis. Now, whenever you have acidosis, that happens in hyperkalemia, but alkalosis can cause hypokalemia. And hyperinsulinism, this is um, where you have too much insulin in the blood, and the patient may be having signs of hypoglycemia, and this can also cause hypokalemia because glucose and potassium, they like each other and they do a lot of the same things. Okay, signs and symptoms. How are your patients going to present with this? A lot of tests like to hit on showing you signs and symptoms and you're supposed to tell what it is or they'll give you a scenario and they'll have all these signs and symptoms listed and you're supposed to pick which one is not a sign and symptom. So I'm gonna go over the signs and symptoms real fast and then I'm gonna give you a neat trick on how to remember those. Okay, remember, in order to understand these signs and symptoms, you need to know that Potassium plays an important role in your muscle and nerve conduction, and it affects the GI system, the renal system, the heart, and the lung muscles used to breathe. So, because when you have low potassium, think of this, everything is going to be slow and low because there's no potassium in the body. The body is just sort of like exhausted and it needs it in order to function. So everything's not going to work correctly. So what you're going to be having is you're going to have a weak pulse that is going to be irregular and thready feeling. Um, orthostatic hypotension. Decreased bowel sounds. Remember, everything's just moving really slow. So the bowels aren't going to be moving. You're not going to be hearing those bowel sounds with your, with your stethoscope. You're going to have decreased deep tendon reflexes because whenever you're hitting the reflexes with your little hammer, they're not going to respond as well because you have low potassium. Low potassium is responsible for muscle contraction. Um, flaccid paralysis, that happens late with really low potassiums, but you could see that. Confusion, I have seen that with really super low potassium levels. Weakness, shallow respirations and diminished breath sounds. And this is because whenever you breathe, you use your muscles, your accessory muscles to breathe. And potassium is responsible in muscle movement and contraction. So if you don't have a lot of potassium, you're not gonna be breathing as well and you're gonna have diminished breath sounds. And EKG changes. Pay close attention to this because this is another NCLEX favorite and professor favorite question to ask you about what you're going to see different on an EKG when a patient has a really low potassium level. Okay, I'm going to show you, but let me tell you what you can see. You're going to see a depressed ST segment. Um, you could also see a flat or inverted T wave and a prominent U wave. So let me show you what a normal EKG looks like first. Okay, right here is a normal EKG. Um, on your PQRS complexes, you have a P wave, this little hump right there. Then you have this little dip, which is called the Q wave. Then you have the R, which is that spike, and then it goes down into the S. And then you have this little segment right here, and then you have the T wave. Now, whenever you're paying attention for hypokalemia, what you're looking for, remember number one, is an ST depression. So um, over here is what it will look like, but let me talk to you about this first. The ST segment is from the S to here, and this part 
right here is going to be depressed. So it'll look like this. Notice how this is depressed. Normally what you'll have is a line on your EKG that runs right here and everything needs to be on that line, but it's depressed below the line. So you'll have ST depression. You can also have a flat or inverted T wave. And notice this T wave on the normal EKG, it just has a little bump right there. And that's a normal, but this can be flipped or it can be flat, like how it's flat right there. And also another thing you may see is a U wave. Notice this does not have a U wave because most people do not have U waves. And you have a beautiful U wave right there. right there. So you can also see that with hypokalemia. So remember, once again, you're gonna have a depressed ST depression. You may have a flat or inverted T wave and um, you may have a U wave. I like to remember this. Remember, everything is slow and low in hypokalemia because hypo means low. So you're gonna have a low ST depression. You may have a flat or low S T wave, which is inverted or low, and then you may have a prominent U wave. So those are just some tricks on how to remember it. Let's look at those seven L's to help you remember the symptoms of how someone would present with hypokalemia. Okay, seven L's. First is lethargic. They're going to be tired and just laying around. Second, they're going to have low, shallow respirations. Remember that comes back to the inability to really use those muscles to breathe. It's going to be just really shallow. Three, lethal cardiac changes. Remember those EKG changes we had. And they can also, if it gets really low, they can go into cardiac arrest. Um, four, loss of urine. Remember, they're going to be peeing a lot and those diuretics like Lasix can cause that if they're on that because they're wasting potassium. Um, next, leg cramps. That is because the muscles are cramping because the potassium levels are too low because potassium plays a level in muscles. Lymph muscles, the flaccid part of that flaccid. And last, low blood pressure and heart rate. Okay, let's look at these nursing interventions because this is where a lot of your test questions are going to come from with hypokalemia. Okay, whenever you have a patient in hypokalemia, you want to watch their heart rhythm, their respiratory status. You're going to watch their GI and renal status. You're looking at their urinary output, watching their, making sure they're not going into renal failure through their BUN and creatinine. And you probably want to put them on a cardiac monitor as well. Most patients will be on, on a telemetry box, but if not, the doctor may order that. Um, watch for, watch their magnesium because magnesium and potassium go hand in hand. They will usually both go down together. And if the potassium level is too, I mean, if the magnesium level is too low, it will probably be hard to get that potassium level to go up. So the physician may order a mag level as well. And you'll wanna watch the glucose, the calcium and sodium levels because all that plays a role in cell transport. Okay, typically a doctor, whenever a patient has, has a level of a 2.5 to 3.5, the physician will normally just order a oral supplement of potassium. And these are the big white pills, patient lo patients love to take them, no, not really. Or you can get a powder and you can mix it in a juice and um, you will give that to them. And you want to give this with food because these medications can cause GI upset. So if the patient can eat, you probably wanna give them something to eat with that. Now levels less than 2.5, a physician will normally order the nurse to star a potassium infusion. Very important to note, you never, ever, ever give potassium as an IV push a sub-Q injection or an IM injection. This is a popular type of test question. They'll throw an option out there and says, potassium level is two, which of the following would you not do? And get potassium IV push would be the option or IM or sub-Q, so pay attention to that. And whenever you're giving potassium IV, you wanna make sure that you follow the bag's instructions, don't adjust the rates because potassium has to be given slowly. You don't wanna give it too fast. Most hospitals have protocols on how to give this, but generally you don't want to give no more than 20 milli equivalents per hour. And if the patient's receiving at least 10 milli equivalents per hour or more, you'll want to put them on a cardiac monitor and watch for any EKG changes. And also, potassium infusions are hard on the veins because you're giving this IV. And um, so you want to watch for phlebitis, which is inflammation of the vein, you notice any redness, or if it infiltrates, meaning that the cannula of the IV came out of the vein and it leaked into the tissues. Okay, next, 
if you notice you're giving say you're giving am meds and the, the patient is ordered some lasix or demodex a thiazide any type of diuretic that wastes potassium causes the patient to urinate and it's wasting the potassium you want to hold that until you talk to the doctor call the doctor and explain that the potassium level is low what do you want me to do about these medications because you can bottom their potassium out next um say the patient's getting digoxin uh, you would not, you would want, want to check, you know, their apical pulse, but you'd also want to check their potassium level with their AM labs. Because if you give DIG whenever the potassium level is low, you can cause, cause DIG toxicity, which is very bad. So always as a nurse, contact, contact the doctor before you give these medications if your potassium level is low. If a patient is on a diuretic and their potassium is low, the doctor may switch them to a type of diuretic that's spares the potassium and this is another big test question that exams like to hit on they'll ask you about which drugs waste potassium and which drugs save potassium potassium sparing and some are your spirone aldactone aldactone is the um, other name for it diazide maxide and triamterene these are ones that will actually save potassium Okay, now another step that you'll want to do is make sure your patient is getting enough potassium in their food. And let me show you a clever way on how to remember potassium rich foods because a lot of times an exam is going to ask you potassium levels low, which of the following foods will be a good to implement in their diet. Let's look at this. A way to remember potassium rich foods is the word potassium and you have it spelled out here. So let's go over it. You have P for potatoes and pork, O for oranges, T for tomatoes, A for avocados, S for strawberries, the other S for spinach, and then you have I, it's fish, F-I-S-H, and then U for mushrooms, and then M for musk melons, which is cantaloupe. And then as a side, also carrots, raisins, and bananas. So that's just a clever way to help you remember potassium rich foods since exams love to ask you what foods are rich in potassium. Okay, so that is an overview of hypokalemia. Now be sure to check out my video on hyperkalemia and do not forget to take the quiz to test your knowledge on how well you grasp this material. So be sure to check out my other teaching tutorials and subscribe to this YouTube channel.